as long as we have time. Best. We just wanted to get it done before the power goes out. Again. Yeah, yeah exactly. No, what you want, you do, is sketchy weather's going to stay on. You want to see how it'll react when the power goes out. We're good. The fog is pretty heavy. It's taking wires down. Yeah, that's what the fog is. <laughs> Was it really foggy? Oh, oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So we're always happy to be in candor. It's just tough getting here. <laughs> So thank you for having us for our annual visit to talk about uh, the BOCES budget. I like to lead off with just a little description of the difference between a BOCES budget versus a school district budget. Your school district budget is a holistic budget, everything in one thing. Now it is broken up the way you report it to your community and administrative capital and program, just like we do, except you are able to move items within your budget um, with a target. Uh, that we can't. Everything within our budget is compartmentalized. One program can't borrow from another program. It's fully funded with its own budget. All those programs add up to a big program budget. And then there's carved off an administrative budget, which is a separate budget from the programs, which funds the back office operations and, and the core administration of the BOCES. And that is something that is billed to all the districts, which is why the districts will vote on the administrative budget but they wouldn't vote on the program budget because that's our business where we're selling to districts the shares so they can get the programs to support their students and you wouldn't want to be voting on whether another district was able to purchase from business so that's why the boards don't vote on the program they only vote on the administrative portion of the budget and of course we have capital expenses too which um the parks and our assistant superintendent for administrative services will go over with you as well. So we're going to go through those three portions and give you a little back little background about who you are in relationship to BOCES, and hopefully you'll find it informative and helpful to you as you consider um, what you want to do moving forward. So this is Canada Central School District in relation to the BOCES. Now, what I mean by that is that number at the top, your resident weighted average daily attendance, is a number the state has for you. It's not a perfect number of the number of students you have. It ends up being a proportional number um, in comparison to all of the districts in the nine districts in the TSB Boces region. So you can see your student body is about 6.33% of all the students in our region. So that's your size compared to the whole region of Boces. Your aid ratio is 81.7%. So that means that any BOCE service that's billed to you under the ARWADA, Residence Weighted Average Daily Attendance, you're going to get almost 82 cents on the dollar back from the state the following year for spending that money at BOCE. It's incentivizing the sharing between school districts. Right now, you have 27 students in career and tech education at TSC BOCES. Your current rolling average is 30.90. That's what you were billed on this year. And next year, it'll be billed on by 29.13. We bill on the three-year rolling average at CTE. Try to level it out so you don't have big spikes up or down. And it's a fairly steady and reliable budget for career and tech education. It's been done that way for years. So that's not billed on 
our WADA, it's billed on a feeder rolling average. So you can see right on that piece of paper there, there's two different ways you're being billed mm -hmm. at PSD POSIs. And there's some other ways districts are billed depending on the service as well. Um, number of students in special ed, 12.89. We bill day in, day out. That's why there's decimals. Same with alternative education. Uh, you have had a student in all education for a period of time. Two students in our PTEC program, and your current contract with us is a little over $3 million of business between the student programs and, and anything else that you're doing with TSP BOCES. And you're purchasing 5.81% of all of our services. So you're just about purchasing your exact same size that your district is. You know, sometimes you'll see a district be spending much more than their size because they have particular needs. And a large district like Ithaca spends considerably less than their size because they can meet a lot of their own needs. So BOCES is, in, is intended to help make sure there's equity between districts and students, no matter where they go to school, have access to the same kind of programs. And that's why the system is set up the way it is. So this is our program budget. And so these are the main buckets of the program, six of them. And you're going to see here a reflection of the federal money that has come through. Um, what the federal government wanted to do was to have school districts try to make up for some of the learning, lost learning opportunities of students. And so many, many of our districts are sharing some programs. They're doing some extra work together through BOCES. So it's not a surprise to see deltas going up. In these program budgets with the percentages, just because exceptional ed say is up 4.45% doesn't mean your bill went up 4.45% because that all depends on the students that you sent to a um, special ed school. So, it really is just a rise in the budget. In fact, we know that exceptional ed is going up because we have some students coming back to our program from other programs now that we're getting beyond um, the COVID and things. Instructional services is, a, is basically just an inflationary cost. It's staying the same. We're not having big additions there. Um, we are having some additions in itinerants. We have some additional ESL students in our region, so we're hiring to support those students. Um, instructional support, that's probably the biggest jump. We have a, many additions to that program. We've had to add two coasters that school districts have asked us um, to add, including community schools, so there's more support for families um, and mental health supports that weren't there before, and those are programs we're starting up. Um, so there's some bigger increases in there, but that's increases in business, not necessarily increases in bills. And we know that some of these larger increases, three or four years from now, it may level off because the federal money will go away and people may not be um, sharing those programs directly with us. And they will have started the programs that they needed to plug those holes that we know we have in kids because of the, the, the shutdown and the remote learning that we had for a year and a half. And you can see non-instructional support up 5.39%. The reason that's going up is we, last year we had a Kew County School District join our central business office. This year we had another um, Kew County School District uh, join our central business office. When another district comes in, the budget goes up. So again, just because the percentage goes up doesn't mean the bill goes up. It just means that we're increasing our business. And Districts are cross-contracting more, even with our neighboring BOCES. Um, we're our increase in cross-contract 6.2%. We facilitate those for our districts. They may go to GST BOCES, they may go to OCM BOCES for something, purchasing equipment from, from the city rent or something <clears> like <throat> that, and those are cross-contracts with other BOCES, and that's increasing as well. Not to mention we know there's inflationary costs happening right now. Um, not all of that is figured into this budget because we don't know where it's going to end up six months from now, but we budget as conservatively as we can. So that's the program. That's not stuff you vote on, but we just wanted to report to you what is happening with the BOCES business. And there's a lot going on. We're creating a lot of things for the districts, trying to be responsive, and uh, we'll see what happens in the years going forward. So overall, the total BOCES budget, when you add everything up together, is going up nearly 6%. Our inflationary costs 
are probably around two and a half. So everything above two and a half is brand new business to BOCES. So that's fairly healthy when, it, when you're looking at the bottom line for business of PSC BOCES. Expense increases of about $2.9 million. And you can see the four largest programs are all increasing in expense. And the last note there is that we do facilitate grants for our school districts, uh, $1.1 million worth. Um, normal, regular, annual things, nothing that's brand new necessarily this year, uh, but once in a while we do, you know, learning tech grants, things like that that will add to that number. Would you like to take over this? Yeah, I can do whatever you want. You want All right. <laughs> so as it is with your budgets, uh, uh, anything in education is certainly people driven to people business. So one of the biggest things that, that's going to drive all of our budgets are our salaries and fringe. Um, <clears throat> for next year, we're looking at about a 3.75% increase in our salaries. Some of that is driven by new new posters that we're, we're doing. But we're also, we know that in order to be uh, uh, competitive with the Dunkin' Donuts and the Targets and everybody else, that if we don't do anything to, uh, to, to address that, we're going to have buildings with no people because they're going to go somewhere else. So we do, we do have some money built into our budgets just to deal with that, and, and we're going to have to do that. Uh, the column on the right is a, the 1.22%. That's what that increase in salary uh, represents according to our whole budget. So the, but the, the salary increase is about a 1.22% of our whole budget. Uh, health insurance, I'm, I'm budgeting 7.47%. Uh, some of that is driven by the percentages of increase in health, health insurance costs. Uh, the other is I do have to put in, uh, in our budget to cover for retirees as they go. And uh, we also have to take care of anyone that has an individual plan, or if you have an individual plan today or no plan, tomorrow they may have a, a family plan. So if we don't budget for that, uh, we're in trouble for next year. So that represents about 1.88% uh, of our budget. Uh, retirement, uh, the good thing is with the way the stock market is right now and all of the, the investments at ERS and TRS are driven by the stock market. So if the stock market's doing great, then we don't have to pay. When it goes down, hang on. So luckily right now it's doing well. Um, it's TRS I think is up slightly, but really not much. But retirement is, is a percentage of salary. So if you're going to increase the salaries, you're going to have to increase your retirement costs to go with that. Uh, the other costs, such as dental, uh, FICA, so on and so forth, FICA is driven off of salaries. Uh, dental costs, uh, obviously, are going to go up. So those are up uh, a little bit more than the rest of them, but that's what we need to do in order to maintain those, those budgets where they are. Uh, just, just shy of 4%, which represents 0.13% uh, of our budget. Our capital budget is actually made up of two pieces. One is uh, an energy performance contract, the EPC, that we did about eight years ago. So we have to pay that lease payment every year for 12 and a half years until uh, that's paid off. That's about a, a 290 plus thousand of that. The rest of that is rent. Uh, by statute, anything that we rent, any properties that we rent. So our adult ed program rents a property down at the PC3 building in the, in the uh, city of Ithaca. And this year, we started renting uh, next door at the IC3 uh, uh, child care um, or child uh, daycare facility so that our uh, uh, early childhood program could be immersed in that program. So we have to pay rent there also. So all of those rents have to be put into this budget. Uh, the adult debt actually reimburses us for that, but by statute, I have to put it in to start with. They write us a check to reimburse that. So you folks don't actually pay the rent for the adult ed uh, program. That comes directly out of the adult ed. But the other rent for the for the uh, CTE program is. So those two those two things, the three things, uh, add up to about $312,000 uh, for that uh, particular budget. Uh, unlike the school districts, BOCES cannot have an unappropriated fund balance uh, at the end of June 30th. Whatever we have not spent, we do all the calculations. And uh, then uh, whatever has been collected for premiums or collected for uh, payments towards all the services, we take all the expenses out of that. And then in, in uh, uh, October, we send a refund back to the districts. 
So every year we start our budgets at zero and uh, build them from there. Um, however, we've collected that uh, cost from the district, whether it be at our WADA or a percent of use or a, a FTE or a flat cost. However we charge the coaster to start with, we whatever's left goes back into the districts in the same uh, fashion. But uh, we, do, we do start over every year. We do have some reserves by statute. These are the only ones that we can have. Uh, unemployment, um, with, a, with the issue that we've dealt with for the last uh, year and a half, certainly uh, changed our balance in the unemployment uh, fund. Uh, but we will work on putting that back together. Uh, the insurance and flex, uh, those are made up of actually the two pieces. One is uh, any flexible spending. It's actually put in this account to set aside. Uh, for uh, anyone that has the flex spending uh, uh, program. And we also are self-insured for our dental, so that also sits there uh, to pay any of the dental claims that come through. Our CPE reserve is one that we started about uh, four years ago. The, the, the reserve was built long before me, but we never felt it was time to fund it. Uh, we finally got to the point where we felt it was time to fund it. And the rationale behind that is <clears throat> When you buy a big piece of equipment, because CPE has a lot of big equipment, uh, car lifts, uh, spray booths, uh, welding equipment. I mean, there's just the, all the big equipment that has to be uh, purchased. We buy those and then depreciate that over 10 years. So we take 10% of the cost of that piece of equipment and put it in the reserve. And the theory behind that is, is when that piece of equipment is wore out or some other piece of equipment is wore out, we can draw the money out of that, buy the new one, and then put it back in as we go. Uh, we're trying to do whatever we can do to always try to level our budgets and level our expenses to the districts. Uh, the worst thing we can do for a, for a district is have uh, spikes up or down. Um, and we don't want uh, your business officials to look like this. So we do whatever we can do to level those out. That would be a brand new <laughs> <laughs> So our, our ERS and TRS reserve were also new ones that uh, we started since I've been there. Uh, and again, that's the same philosophy. When times are good, let's put some money in there. Uh, and when times are not, we'll draw it out and try to keep our budgets and our expenses to you folks as steady as, and, and as even as possible. Our administrative budget is the one budget that, uh, like Dr. Madison said, is the one that you folks will vote on, you and your counterparts and all, of, all the districts in TST Bosey's area. We'll vote on this one, uh, whether or not that this is acceptable to you. Um, one of the things, like I said before, we have to do is make sure that we can uh, hire and uh, maintain the folks that we have in the, in the organization. So we did put a little bit more in our, our uh, administrative uh, lines for salaries this year, but we did everything we could do with all the rest of them to either hold them or reduce them. Um, you'll notice that our uh, contractual is down about 30,000. Our um, cafeteria has finally become uh, in the red or in the black instead of running in the red. So we felt it was time that we could actually take that uh, 30,000 that we had in there to fund that if we needed to, we could take it out. So we did what we could do to level that one off. The one that I do want to point out is the line uh, 841, retiree health insurance. So anyone that retires from PSD BOCES, regardless of what coaster they come from, whether it's CTE, exceptional ed, administration, maintenance, I don't care where you work, uh, but uh, when you retire and contractually are uh, eligible to have retirement health insurance or dental insurance, by statute, those costs have to be in the administrative budget. So even if you retire from CTE, that cost doesn't show up in CTE, it shows up in the administrative budget. So uh, we do have to budget for all of our retiree uh, uh, benefits in this particular line. Um, it's a, almost half of our budget now, uh, which I, it's always a tough one to see, uh, looking at over $2 million in retiree health insurance. Uh, but then when I talk to my counterparts and they're running in the 70 to 80% of their uh, health or their uh, admin budget, then I don't feel quite so bad about it. But it's still a big number. Uh, and we are always negotiating to try to figure out ways to, to make that either flatten or at least peak and, and not keep escalating as it does. Uh, but those are contracts that we negotiated years ago and uh, are obligated to provide those, those uh, uh, benefits for our retirees. 
So when we get all said and done, uh, there is some miscellaneous revenue that I that I show every year uh, in, the, in this particular <coughs> budget, and they're usually pretty close, uh, give or take a, a slight amount, but they're usually pretty close. So um, we're looking at about a 4.52% uh, increase in the budget uh, for the administrative budget that will come to you folks as uh, what you will actually vote on. So any questions with that one? Because that's yes. the one that you folks get yes. to vote on. No, no, no. Okay, okay. I just want to make sure. Um, so the vote for the administrative budget and for board members at TSD BOCES has to happen sometime between April 16th and April 30th of every year. Uh, this particular year is going to be on April 20th. So you'll vote on the administrative budget that I uh, just uh, talked about and representatives from uh, Kander, uh, Dryden, and George Jr. Uh, so that'll happen on uh, April 20th. Any questions? Well, we certainly do appreciate you taking a little time out of your out of your busy meetings and letting us uh, present to you. Thanks for coming down. Nice yeah. to see you guys. Absolutely. You. Nice Thank to you. see all of you. Thank you. Drive safely. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Thanks. We hope. Drive safely and walk for deer. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you to Linda, who will be our uh, returning, right? We're voting for you. It's an honor and a pleasure. You're still going to do it, right? As far as I know at this moment. Yes, you are. Yes, thank you for your service. Yeah. We're extremely grateful for who you said. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. With or without that. Oh, well, there are perks no, no, no. to having you come to those meetings. We didn't say you couldn't get out get out of the ring pie. <laughs> I make their desserts for our dinners. Oh, wow. Pies, usually. Sorry, I think everybody knows. Thank you. Have a good evening. I might say that when we have the first of the month, we have Friday meetings, and Linda and I travel there together. And it's always like, oh, Linda, you're here. And then it's like, oh, you brought him. <laughs> but I go with it. It's okay. I was just thinking that. Right? She's not even always here. <laughs> it's always a joy. <laughs> I always learn something. Whether I want to or not. <laughs> learn is a pretty broad term. Yeah, but, you know, we have to be. Wow. All right, back back on back on track. Um, wanted to let them get on their way. So next up is to accept the CSC and CPSC reports and review in executive session. I'll make a motion. Thanks, Josh. Okay. Well, two. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. And the minutes of our last meeting is January 20th. Any questions or revisions? I'll make a motion to accept it. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Thanks, Kate. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Excellent. Reports. Treasurer's report. Okay. Guys, I have to tell you, I'm really sorry. I'm walking in some reports. I just keep on and pass it down. Um, normally, you know, I try not to. It's just a lot has happened in a week, and it is such a crazy, busy time. So, you know, I hope I hope you guys have a chance to go through those. Um, please read them. I'm, I'm not going to read all of this out loud. I'm just going to kind of touch on my report and the important things. So, Please take the time and, and read what's here and let me know if you have any questions. Happy to meet you guys after. So I went through my two reports and I'm not gonna, you know, take a, a ton of your time. Um I've I've got you know budget transfers and expenditure reports and treasurer reports for your review. You know, take the time to look through. If there's anything you need clarification on, please let me know. Um I had to have the board reapprove our corrective action plan related to the audit for the 630-21 audit. The state kicked it back and said they wanted to see actual implementation dates on it. 
So I said, okay, that's fine. I added it, and that is in the consent agenda for reapproval. Um, you know, we, we had our budget meeting, and I know, you know, Brent has gone through a lot of this, so I'm just going to touch on what's important to, to me. Um, I was really happy to see the foundation aid coming through the way the state promised last year. It's huge for us because, you know, we have this funding clip coming. Um, you know, we, we have the ARP grants through, you know, 2024. Um, and once those are gone, you know, we're, we're going to have all of the things that are on that grant needs to be able to come, those grants need to be able to come back to the general fund. So these raises in our foundation aid, you know, making us whole for um, our foundation aid that we should have been getting, this is going to be a huge help to allow us to continue on, you know, absorbing these expenditures back into the general fund. So that's going to be a big help. And of course, as Brent mentioned, we're going to be looking really closely at expenditures and making sure that, um, you know, we, we have things very lean and we're, we're ready for that to happen, that money to kind of go away. Um, so the money that we got in our foundation aid was 643000 That, I think this is real. I think, you know, I'm, I'm so optimistic about it. I hope nothing's going to come back at me. But we should be, you know, we're seeing this amount. We're going to see that amount again next year. Um, and, I, you know, that's that's just going to be really important for us. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on from that. Just a quick buildings and grounds report. I have a recommendation in the consent agenda to be um, adding two full-time custodians to be appointed. Um, we've been down two custodians and one ground staff due to just long-term illnesses and injuries, and we don't have any guarantees of those people coming back. So this is really going to be a huge help for us. Um, you know, make us whole again, and we'll be able to um, just you know meet the custodial grounds needs for the district. So we're really excited about that. And is that in the budget that we reviewed? I mean, you're anticipating that? Yes, and you know, there are some salaries that are on grants, um, so that's, you know, helping yeah, yeah. afford these things. And, you know, we had a lot of increases with COVID cleaning, right. Um, right. you know, just for materials for that, and also, you know, we need more bodies to do the work. So, um, but honestly, this is where our staffing levels have, have been at, have sh they should have been at. So this is getting us back to where we need to be. So that would be very good. We're so, I mean, did we get that. reimbursed by the PPE, PPP, the payroll protection plan, for so, those extra cleanings? No, not yet. Personal protection. Yeah. Protection? No, it's, 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 so they were, they were yeah. supposed to be some money that was coming back through, you know, filing our um, federal payroll reports. And yeah. I haven't seen it yet. Okay. There's a line on our 941s where we can put that in, but. Um, I, I'm really not sure what's going on with it. Okay. I mean, I can look into it. Look no, no, I'm just wondering if it's a check in the mail or has it been delivered? Mm -hmm. Apparently, I think it may be coming back as credits yeah. on our on our 941. Oh, because they did the you know, credit yeah. alone didn't make promises. I thought we were they wanted us to keep people employed, even though exactly, you know, and especially for COVID cleaning any contractual right. work, I wouldn't want you to be able to. Right. Yeah. Sorry, I just. Well, that's okay. I mean, it's great that we've been able to put some of that on the grants and help it, you know, be affordable. Right. Um, and, you know, those people are going to come back off the grants, too. So this yeah. is this is great. It's going to be a huge help for us. Um, it's definitely going to challenge to, to keep the buildings going, you know, the level that we like to have them at. So anyway, now I'm moving over to my other report <laughs> when I walked in. Um, so there are treasurer's reports in here. Just to kind of give you guys an update on our tax position. We're in a really good place right now. I love the springtime. I love pretty much any time from September on because that's when all the cash really starts coming in. So um, we're in a good place right now. That's going to continue throughout, you know, the spring as we get these big state aid payments that we're we are looking for in our general aid. So um, that's going to. I'm expecting that to remain very strong through the end of the year. And we do have huge payments that go out in June that kind of push us into this dry period over the summer, but for right now we're doing really well. So I'll keep you guys posted. Um, Brent had mentioned our tax cap, so that calculation, it's in here in case you guys want to see it in a little more detail. Our cap is at 2.09%. If we went out of the cap, that would bring in $124,560. Okay. So um, just information for you. We have, I have another grant that just, came in, another grant, There's so many grants. Um, this one is really small. It's only $4,432. 
It's for specifically for homeless students. We already have a money that's allocated for our homeless students out of the Title I grant. Um, we have, you know, we budget for five students. We currently have five students that we're using the money for. This is students who've had, you know, lost due to house fires, things like that. So they, in order to use this money, though, we have to join a consortium of other districts. And this just was released two days ago. So I have a business officials meeting tomorrow morning at OZ's, and you know, bring it up then and, and see what other districts are doing, because I believe other TST districts have these small allocations. Mm -hmm. um, so I have that grant, and then one of my ARP grants was kicked back. They wanted, the state wanted some, you know, further detail on materials and supplies. They, they're very specific. You know, you have to, I'm listing like individual items that we're purchasing for the classrooms. So it's really become very detailed. It's, it's getting a lot of scrutiny. Um, and I, I'm like very lucky. I stumbled into our state contact who's going to be able to help me with these grants. So I've been going back and forth with this person and she's been a huge help. She's like, okay, this is what, you know, the state needs to see. This is the level of transparency and she's watched me through a lot. So that feels like this lifeline that I'm just desperately holding on to. Um, so that's great. Cause I, so this grant's been resubmitted. I have three more ARP grants to write for next week. So. <laughs> just work it. So many grants. It's great to have the money. It's a lot of hoops to jump through to get it. And a lot, a lot of fiscal monitoring. So um, it's good. It's just, you know, it's going to take a lot. Anyway, that's what I've got for you guys. Please let me know if you have any questions. Um, and I'm sorry, you know, I, I know I've lost stuff in. If you have a chance to look at it, let me know if any clarification. Is the Homeless Children Grant new? Or yeah. did they just change the way you have to group together to access the money? It's new money. Okay. It's it's new um, ARP money. You know, they're more stimulus grants. And it's so funny because this is, you know, there's also the, um, the new ARP IDEA money, which is specifically for special ed. We don't really get a heads up that these grants are coming. I just get an email that says, you have a new allocation. Like, oh, all right, hey. It seems okay. Yeah, <laughs> our other grant. Thank you. Mm -hmm. can go through. Oh. Can I get a motion to approve the treasurer's report, or reports that came in again? Thanks, Nate. Second. Thanks, Mike. All those in favor? Right. Okay. Any opposed? And then the appropriation transfers, which they're not part of this. We did get those in advance. Yeah. Anybody have questions on those? No. Okay. Is there a motion to approve those? I'll move. Thanks, Brent. Okay. Thanks, Kate. All those in favor? All right. Hi. Any opposed? All right. Moving on. Warrants. So the first one is General Fund A37. Anybody have questions on any of those? I was happy to see we have ski club. I didn't know that was that. How many kids did that serve? We've merged it with Spencer Manhattan. Um, I believe we had about eight students that are participating. Spencer had an equal amount. I think there's about 18 or 20, you know? Yeah, I don't know. Sure, that sounds about right. Up there. Yeah. We're up there right now. Early. <laughs> I did notice that it was Thursdays, all the dates were Thursdays. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And it's 9 through 12 or 7 12? Uh, we went 9 through 12. Yeah, because Spencer's just at a high school as well. Very cool. Very cool. Let's go. I didn't know anything else. Everybody else? All right. We move on to federal funds number 19. Middle Brook was a that was a split with Spencer. Is that yeah? 
we as the hosting district had to pay Spencer's portion of Middlebrook and then we were reimbursed through both seats. Okay. Yeah, it's the first time they they sort of changed the way that um the that whole flow of, of money works. So this was different, but I get it. It's <laughs> as long as it all checks out with you yeah. in the end. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin and I had some interesting conversations where I was like, wait a minute, walk me through again. Did you buy my thing? <laughs> and then school lunch fund number 20. Just quite short. Yep. There are a motion to approve all three. I'll make a motion. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Nate. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Awesome. Recognition of visitors. So we we sent several of our visitors on their way already. But we have we have multiple visitors. Hi, visitors. Hi. <laughs> Either if you want to make any comments or or. No? Okay. There's another chance at the end, Katie. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> we have no consideration, so we're on to the consent agenda, including some walk ins tonight. Yeah. Are there any items? That should be pulled out for separate consideration. Okay. And are there any questions on any of the items? I will just say I am happy to see mergers for baseball and softball so that our kids are going to get a chance to play this spring after a couple of bummer years. <laughs> yeah. Motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll make a motion if nobody else. Mike and I, Josh had a second. second. All those in favor? Okay. Any opposed? Okay. You got through that swimming lane reports. Wayne, you're up. All right. We'll start off with uh, our academic intervention review team that we've assembled. Um, post COVID, or I'm not quite, hopefully, getting close to post COVID, um, realizing that the gaps that in the learning that the students had are. are sizable yeah. um, as we're getting to the point where we're feeling comfortable having some of the high school students ride the elementary run home with pre-approval and, and making sure that we can keep students as safe as possible um, we're falling back really what we're falling back to is our old interventions which primarily were after school stay after from 2 30 to 3 and get extra help with teachers um, and I'm over the years, uh, we've had many things after school. We've had homework club. We've had some tutoring after school. And we've just never had the results. We don't feel we've really had the success level that we would like to see for our students. And that's before COVID. So now here we are. We have these students that have these gaps. And we're like, we've we just got to do better. We've just got to find better and more innovative and, and ways of um, supporting our students and helping them. Uh, get back to where they need to be. So, you know, thinking about this, I've assembled a team of administrators, teachers, counselors, and just let's just sit down and brainstorm. Let's just wipe this slate clean, think fresh. What are some things we can do? And one of the things we're really trying to focus is on during the school day, because our big yes. challenge is once the bell rings at 2.20, kids are out the door. And, and unless the parents are really going to support the school, and saying that my kids got to stay after and you can give them a consequence, we really don't have much success. But we do have them during the school day. So we're really trying to focus on what are some interventions we can put in place during the school day um, that, that are going to be effective in supporting our students. So that's what we're, that's what we're looking at. And um, we're making some good progress. Uh, we've got some good ideas. I think we've got some good ideas on the way. Um, it's going to be hard. 
because what we're doing, one of the one of the advantages of having it after school is you don't got to take away those inter intervention times. Don't take away from the class time. How do you balance that? Keeping the class time for all the students and then giving them the support they need. That's that's the real challenge. So, you know, if I put in intervention, something else has to go. That's that's what we're trying to balance. Which you know how to how to how to make that balance work. Try to make the trade offs least painful one way or other as possible. So we're working on that. I think we're getting some good ideas. I think we're going to have some good plans in place. Um, and uh, I'll keep you posted on how and what the plans are when we get there. But I appreciate the team. It's been some good meetings we've had so far. Uh, we, Brett and I have met with our all of the departments. I think we've gotten to the point where we've met all the departments now. Um, it was great just to have, for Brent to have the opportunity to meet all of our teachers more more individually as a small department. Um, and really what we want to do too is just find out what their vision is for their department and what are some goals? What are some short-term and long-term goals? Where do they see their department five years from now? And then what can we do to support that? So I thought we had some really good conversations. Um, they have some, some good ideas. Brent, I think, shared some really good ideas with them that some of them were real excited about. They appreciate the support that he showed for the programs. and. Uh, I, I think it made them feel better and that they were heard and they were able to express their vision and, and find out, you know, what kind of what level of support we can we can give them. I think we got some really good plans for our departments moving forward. So thank you, Brent, for taking the time to do that. And uh, I just want to keep you uh, posted on the ag program updates. Uh, Becky Amen and I went up and met with T. Hansen, the executive director of the Cornell Cooperative Extension. Um, and Bobby Ann Kuhlman, who's the 4-H director, um, talking more about the courses. Um, the, I, I put down in here that we're in animal science and environmental ed, seem like that, and that, that's still looking really good to get that going. Um, the small injury repair just doesn't look like I don't have a teacher right now. It has someone in mind, or just, it just doesn't look like it's gonna happen. That's not necessarily a bad thing, getting two programs up and running. Um, in a facility, they have the space, but the space is not finished. Um, we talked a little bit about investment. If we're going to start this ag program, we're going to have to invest some time and money into it to get it up and running uh, for this next year. So Becky went up there. We have some ideas, but it, there, there's a lot of work to do, and uh, September will be here before you know it. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to get, if we can get two programs up and running for next year, I'll be happy, and, and we're going to do it, even if I got to go up there and do it. So. <laughs> And no one wants that, trust me. <laughs> um, and one of the things we are doing right now, uh, we need to get the course descriptions for these courses to Jason because our course selection for the students starts after February break. So after February break, we're gonna, Jason will be calling some students in and, and hopefully we can get a sizable amount of students to, to sign up for these ad programs and get it off the ground. So that's where we're at. So our are we candor investing in the physical plant up there or how does that work because they're a county you know cc is a county organization yeah we're going to have to talk about that whether and that's something brent will have to get involved at some point as far as how we split the cost into the facility i certainly think that the you know any of the uh, materials lab whether it's lab materials or things that are there for our classroom would be our responsibility whether it's you know whether we have to pay for um, insulation and sheetrock in a facility that's not ours. I don't know if that should be our responsibility, but I haven't really got into the nuts and bolts and the details of the expenses yet, but that would seem reasonable to me. I know T is looking for money. And, you know, where that's going to split out, I would think a fair balance would be that, you know, in their, in their facilities, they finish the facilities, but for us, tables, sort of you the know, if we have some animals up there, feed, you know, lab expenses, anything for the classroom, we should we should pay for that. Well, Stuff that we can physically take out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and bring back if we want to. Um, will this will the classes that you just put together be offered to Spencer Burnett as well? I mean, it's like halfway. Um, I called halfway. Missy and told her yeah. that Missy Jewel right. yeah. over there. I called yeah. her and told her that we are starting an ad program. Made her aware of it. And if she wants the course descriptions, we can give them to her. It was, I, I they would welcome it. Um, she's interested. I know they have their own ag programs at Spencer Manhattan. So whether they would feel that it would conflict with theirs, I don't know. 
Would, um, yeah. would there be a possibility of like a BOCI coaster paying back so we get back in 1% aid or whatever? Uh, as far as getting into some type of kickback, for them, we have to find a partner school. Well, that's what I wondered. If yeah, we have Spencer to find a partner part. school. If we did, we could do that. And yeah. if Spencer got involved with that, that's certainly something. We could yeah, do. even though they're in a different BOCI, but it doesn't matter. Still do the end of yeah. yeah. There might be incentive for both. Yeah. Um, yep, we could do that. As if you need more, thing, more coordination on your plate, but we'll get there. the 80 cents you know, dollars. Um, just, you know, we can get kids in, in the seats and yeah. in the courses to start. That's great. And once we get up and running, we can fine tune things. But yeah, we'll get there. There's a lot of options. If we can have our kids up there, for, uh, you know, uh, participating in these courses and then, you know, get some, maybe get Spencer or Tyler Central's not that far away. That's so right. want to come yeah. over there. Um, we go. Really they have a lot far. going on. Candor's a nice central location it is. It is. in Tioga County. So. Tioga's got a lot of lot going on with like FFA. And they, that. Do. they have a pretty strong ag program yeah. too. So. They do? Yeah. Yeah. Did we have an FFA at any time? Uh, not years. since I've been around here. Yeah, no. years ago, I think. Really? Years and years ago. Because we had it when that was cool. My dad yeah. was in it, yeah, yeah, a million years ago. month of January. Um, the first chart there shows you the reading scores. And you'll see, and you saw the data that, you know, we had shared at the beginning of the year, we had 18% of our students testing proficient. At this point in that first column, you see that now our kids have grown. We sh we've shown 22% increase in our proficiency rate in reading. So we've got 40% students um, now scoring proficient. And it, like Wayne said, we're coming out of, you know, half days cohorts um, of instruction. So we're happy with this growth and we celebrated this growth, but we also recognize that we have a lot of work to do and um, gaps to fill. So I would also just direct your attention to the one year below column for reading. And you can see that we've still got a really big group of students scoring just one, one grade level below. So, and we'll talk about our intervention efforts and our data meetings in just a second, but that's a, just recognizing that's a very large pod of students that's, again, just one year below. Um, I ready math scores shown in the next chart. You can see, as you know, we started the year with 9% of our students scoring proficient. Now we have 28% of our students scoring proficient in math, according to the iReady, 19% progress. And again, in that second column, I guess it's technically the third column, but one year below, you can see that we have a big pot of students, 56% of students scoring just one year below. Um, so to draw from that, our data meetings that we used to... Um, analyze this set of data, it was really largely focused on the instructional components of what the intervention is going to look like. We did get a little bit messy with all students' names on sticky notes, and we were able to put them in the groups, or I was able to have them in the groups so the conversations could be pretty quick and efficient in terms of this is where the kids are, what else do you know about these children, does this indicate how they're performing in the classroom, we could make some tweaks, and then we could really get into the iReady diagnostic data by domain and talk about what skills these kids need in addition to core instruction, right? That's not changing. It's the tier two intervention that we need to implement to fill those gaps and fill those holes that the students have. So instructional teams being all the grade levels, one at a time, each grade level one at a time with the AIS teachers who also support the grade levels during the intervention block. We're able to plan very intentional 
instructional efforts to happen during those 30 to 40 minute blocks of time. It's <clears throat> scheduling wise, it's much easier for reading because we have those intervention blocks scheduled into our master schedule. Math, we lack that intervention time. So grade levels and Pete helps out with this a lot as the math, um, kind of the math instructional leader, grade levels have to be a little more creative there with where they're gonna fit that math instruction in, or intervention, I'm sorry. And a lot of them are choosing to use the last 15 minutes, 20 minutes of the core instructional block, two days of the six day cycle. So kids are getting about 30 minutes of intentional math intervention. Not as much as we would like, but that's one of the things that we'll be looking at over the summer, well, earlier than that, this spring and over the summer when it comes to our master schedule, and really prioritizing some time, some carved out time for math intervention. So we are, we have plans in place. Instruction is, targeted instruction is happening. And you know, that last sentence, I'm kind of picking me, myself for writing in the spring, we'll be monitoring progress sooner than that. But when I say in the spring, that's um, connected to iWriting. There's another growth monitoring piece, which is a smaller assessment, it's not a full diagnostic, but the, I don't know, half of the time it takes them to take it. And for the kids that are getting tier two intervention, we'll give the growth monitoring to make sure that they're responding to the intervention during the intervention block. So that's another huge reflective piece for the instructional teams to come together and look at, are we doing, or what, what we are, is what we are doing working? Um, any questions about that? Okay, and then I saw how Kitten organized her chart, and it's much easier <laughs> to read. So not a great chart organizer. And if I could show you my colors, it would be better. Okay, but. but if we could just, you know, join forces, then we'd have right. the best because although ours was just initial data so i couldn't put it all in but you at least had all the on grade level below grade level yeah we should have talked <laughs> anyways um <laughs> we'll just talk right now yeah. you know yeah. about yeah. how this looks yeah. we're, we're gonna figure uh -huh. out what, what a boy and a boy one okay i, I, know. Know. I, I have that noted on my quick play uh, <laughs> but at this rate you guys are doing very well right? our kids would be in do you attribute that that large chunk in just a short amount of time because the kids were maybe just right on the edge, or is it because they're now focused, or is it? Yeah, I think we attribute that growth. We we asked that very question during the or, or the I read meetings, the data meetings. What when we were celebrating the growth before we get down to the nitty gritty? What can we attribute this growth to? And it was a few things. It was the consistent core curriculum that we're now using, that everybody's using with Fidelity, um, that vertical alignment piece. We haven't seen the benefits of that yet, but the consistent use of a very comprehensive program. Um, being in school full days. I mean, every teacher that came out of their mouth very quickly, having our kids full days. Um, yeah, those are really the two main things that they're attributing that growth to. Something else that I, and I want to just highlight a practice Katie used in the elementary school and Kurt Bastian actually used it here in the junior high. They had goal setting sessions with the kids. So every teacher in the elementary building, they talked with the students about their beginning of year, their boy score, and their, you know, and, and prepping for the, the assessment. And I would add that to that one know, of the too. factors. Thank you. Yeah. And and I guess I'm basing some of this on what Kurt shared with me. Um, he did that on his own, and he said what a difference it made um, with his, you know, smaller yeah, pot of kids. Sense. But yeah, okay. so we yeah, are going to. Well, I won't. I can talk about it very much. But yeah, that is a very big thing, and the te the kids just buying into this is my score. I'm going to try my best. I'm going to do better, and they're already That's gearing true. up for the next time that they'll take it in June. But that is big, and it's really important skill to motivate kids and to have that growth mindset, but to let them see it for real, you know, when they're taking the assessment in real time, as soon as that score pops up, the teacher has a sheet that we had given them and they were documenting their new score and being able to see it. So that was big too. We'll look forward to the EOR. Yeah, if we can do that again, to the what? Oh, the EOR. Yeah. Maybe it'll be. 
I was going to say here. Foy, but no, that movie. Never mind. It says here it's because of the fantastic motivation of the administration, faculty, and staff of the Kansas school system. <laughs> that, did I read that right? <laughs> no, you really did. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and then we just highlighted something here that the phys ed departments were doing, and they actually, in the high school and right. elementary mm -hmm. school, um, joined forces with usually for our monopoly fitness, fitness monopoly that John and Katie do with the elementary students. They bring in the fifth and sixth graders and it's hard to schedule. And this year we came up with another idea because we're trying to preserve those academic blocks as much as possible. We have the high schoolers. They have the high schoolers come over and do the fitness monopoly with the students. And they were able to read the cards to them and go through the activities. We put some pictures on the website um, the kids really enjoyed it and it was a lot of fun. Something to highlight there. Um, and then just thank you everybody for the support. It's been emotional. It's been difficult. Um, appreciate the support from everybody. It was, it was really nice just to see everybody come together and honor Amy. Um, we'll continue to talk about some things we can do to honor Amy and just the tremendous impact she had. We knew, but to see families write notes and send flowers and just all of the support that was received for the school building um, and her, her family. It was really nice, so thank you. And thank you for the approval of Jackie because we couldn't have done it without Jackie really stepping up and um, being there to manage the elementary school office and take care of all of us. And um, she knows that she has big shoes to fill, but she's going to um, do a Monday's job as the um, elementary secretary. Okay. Hey. Right. Right. So the first item on there, um, just a couple weeks ago, five football coaches and I went to a conference um, up in Syracuse with the intent to have to host an in-house um, coaches clinic here for our youth association it looks like i've reached out to the youth director and it looks like we're going to set that up uh, hopefully in march april time and really that's to build on our philosophy of including the youth commission and try to participate uh increase increase the participation numbers um, in the program throughout the, the elementary school on into the high school so we're going to set that up um to sort of let them know what the expectations and the components of the sbc high school program expect for kids coming into our program. Um, it was a great conference. There's top-notch coaches from Division One college football all the way to um, some local state champions over in Tioga and Waverly and some Ithaca coaches. Um, they all had a lot of great things. I think the most that we took away was from the, how to build small school programs. There were several um, conferences just on small school programs alone. Um, and there's a lot of great things that we're going to focus on in our coaches clinic that we learned from those um, conferences. So it's a great conference um, all together. The analytics from our YouTube channel, I, uh, I put down there just for your reference in case you wanted to take a look at them. The most, uh, the number that jumps out to me is at 33,000 views um, in the past year. Um, that alone just shows how, how important this especially nowadays, this uh, virtual component is to our programs. It exposes a lot of people in a lot of different parts of the country. And as you can see there, outside of the country, yeah. um, as far as viewing our programs. Uh, the steering committee, I put the steering committee notes on the following page, as far as what we discussed going forward with the spring sports. And really what the last page there is where our discussion starts, the viability rubric that um, we really need to focus on and focus on the conversations. This isn't the be-all, end-all of our decision-making process within the um, SBC steering committee, but what really we focus on mostly is the participation numbers and age appropriateness, um, which is why you see the most current merge is happening this month um, that you all just approved. Just the participation numbers weren't there and the age appropriateness wasn't there. Um, we were bringing eighth graders up to varsity, ninth graders up to varsity. Just, it's not a way to build a program. Um, so really, we start with this document, and then we move forward with a bunch of other factors 
and transportation, um, you know, COVID this past couple, this past year. So there's a lot of factors that go into the decision making process of the steering committee, along with input from coaches and um, at all levels. So, I, can I just share one thing? Yes, yeah. I was yeah. there when we when we uh, Papa Hancock shared that rubric with us. Um, and we, of course, tailored it to our needs, but we did a lot of, we had a lot of discussions with MERV schools, with the section, what are, what are healthy numbers for a program? And through the years, whenever we have followed this rubric in making our decisions, it's been a good decision. Any time that we've had um, the coaches given us some optimistic numbers that weren't hard numbers, but they said, I know we'll have the kids, and we said okay and went away from the rubric we'll trust your judgment that's when it's falling apart that's when programs have folded um and i understand coaches want to keep their you know keep their identity and keep their own programs but really what's happening is, is oftentimes that they're just they're just really hurting their own programs and folding this rubric has been solid we can follow this rubric once where it hasn't where it has led us astray. This is a good, solid pro, uh, rubric. I honestly told um, Terry Doherty after we've used a few or something, you ought to take that thing and patent it. And really, it's, it's great for merge schools and it's great for helping guide decisions. Um, so I, I, I just, I, I believe in it. And I believe, I agree with Pete, we should, re we should refer back to it more often. Sometimes we get away from it, but it's a very solid rubric that works well for us. And when we don't follow it, it's when we get in trouble, and I hope the boards can can understand and support that too. When the steering committee makes decisions, at some point we might get—I know Spencer might be running into right now—a situation where they're having parents and families, and they're upset. We can have our own team. Well, we've heard that before, and it's good until it's not good. Right. And then we're scrambling to even try to have a program if you can at all. So thank you for your support. By the way, good. sorry, Pete. No. <laughs> Thank you. If you just out of curiosity, for the numbers that get listed there for the, the softball teams, mm -hmm. um, so with the merging taking place, does that mean like the eighth grader is going to go back down to at least JV? I'm assuming they must have passed the, the testing. So would they slide back down to JV or are they going all the way back to modified? Or So what's for Kander? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. So oh, the eighth grade up on varsity? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm unsure. I'm, from what I hear, that student athlete is, uh, has the skill set to play varsity. However, I'm not sure. We haven't had a, that conversation yet. She she hasn't passed the passed the APP yet. Gotcha. Um, so we haven't done those conversations yet. We're going to see how tonight goes in both districts, then make that decision. I'm not sure that's a good choice if we do much. I, I was just going to say, with, with Spencer having ten players with two freshmen, I would assume the two freshmen be push back to JV, but with 10 players at Candor and one of the eighth graders, if we have eight appropriate age level from Spencer and then the nine from Canada, it gives us 17 bodies. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that the eighth grader, if she's up, would probably disappoint some people if yeah. the eighth grader on a team that size, yeah. someone's not playing much. Mm -hmm. I'm just I agree with you 100%. It might be a tough conversation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I can see that individual moving to JV. Yeah. Um, or I don't know their skill set. I'm yeah. just given that name by the coach and gotcha. I included in those numbers. Mm -hmm. But the APP will, you know, when we have those conversations, the APP committee will talk about that and we'll go from there. Mm -hmm. But I agree with you. Right? Thanks, Pete. So, yeah, I put that in the conversation, in the notes okay. down there. So, I talked to the league about giving us an additional right. schedule. So we can merge since our numbers okay. will be so yeah. big. Yeah. That's fantastic. Such a swing. Yeah. From a <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So I think by the agenda, the first report listed is curriculum and instruction. So learning walks. Um, I had Kathy attach the um, observation tool that the admin team will use when we visit the classrooms. Um, I did my first one yesterday um, in one of our senior high English classes and yeah, I went in, filled it in, and then left that information for the teacher and then kept my own copy just for our own data collection, but that just 
is for you to look over if you've already looked it over. If you have a question about it, feel free to ask. I know you heard us all talking about the work that we've been doing, and now this is the, the product. Um, second item on my is summer school, the curriculum planning uh, was a February, sorry, I almost said March early release date. We're not there yet. February early release date was productive in that every grade level uh, put together this document for us that has reading, writing, math, what are those three priority skills for your content area by grade level. So 10th grade teachers, we now have a, a document that shows that and now it'll be up to us. More of the work will be done in Wayne's building, the elementary, by grade level, they really did prioritize and they all work together where at the high school, we're gonna have to look through that as a team and identify and prioritize what are those reading and writing and math skills that we could start creating lessons around for summer school. Uh, I think Brent, you're going to talk more about that, or you might have to. Okay. The junior high data meetings. Uh, so one of the responsibilities that I've um, handed off to Pete and Beth for the junior high data meetings, uh, with taking over. The responsibilities of special ed, that's one thing, the junior high data meetings that we, Pete's, Pete and Beth have taken charge of um, this past week, actually, past week and a half. So junior high took the iReady diagnostic later than the elementary school. And the data there just represents for reading and math, where are kids that are on grade level? Um, and again, BOI, beginning of year, middle of year, and then yes, we will have end of year data. We did not, as I've already said, uh, we didn't do that whole setting with the junior high kids, but we will um, for end of year, just to see what kind of difference it makes. And I already referenced what Kurt already observed um, is was telling and the junior high teachers want to. A couple of things I didn't have in the report that I want to know. Um, one is going back to last month, Wayne, I think, mentioned it. Our high school teachers are using iReady Diagnostic. The math, so algebra, ninth and 10th graders, we had them take the diagnostic to identify the kids that might need that additional intervention that Katie's referenced, tier three, uh, the more than two years below grade level. Who are those students? And what's interesting to note that's new, just this week, Pete, right, we received an email from our ninth grade mm -hmm. English teachers asking, is it possible to have our ninth graders take the reading diagnostic? So we are going to move forward with that. So the diagnostic, you, we could give it right up through 12th grade, have our seniors take that. The only difference is the lessons, the personalized learning lessons or the teacher-led lessons only go up through eighth grade. But we can still use the diagnostic. And I guess, I think that's exciting for us because it just shows that the teachers are, I'm not saying it's shifting their mindset, but they have a tool now that they can use in addition to their their classroom quizzes, tests, and assessments. So I wanted to add that. Do they get fun little cartoon aliens and games like the elementary kids do? Uh, do? Seventh and eighth grade do. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Middle they're schoolers. a little bit different as they go up through the grades. They're not as primary looking. Like they literally look like stuffed animals with little kids and they become like these robot looking things. They're a little better. Than they are, but the kids are like, it's hope. It's a little, yeah. yeah they, it does get old. The, the my path <laughs> that we had the kids doing pretty frequently last year, they're doing it much less because we have to. Yep, you heard about it. Really. But it is, it, it, it's definitely a useful tool. Yeah. And we've been in pretty close contact with curriculum associates the producers of iReady and they know and they're working on a middle school module. So they, oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. And the other great thing about the iReady is that it is norm reference. It's nationally norm. So any kids so, taking those tests, yeah. it's, you know, classroom assessments and formative assessments are great tools to guide your instruction. But when we look at the big picture and the screening that we need to see how our kids mm -hmm. are scoring, the iReady, that's what it does mm -hmm. for us. Any questions about curriculum instruction. Yeah, I mean, just move right into... Yeah. Okay. Case hats. Yeah. Um, different glasses. No. So, um, well, 
interesting that the day after I submitted my report um, in the consent agenda, you've already acted upon uh, the CSE secretary. We fortunately for her, this is a, her previous employer asked her back, and it's just it's a good move for her and her family. Our loss, um, however. Transitions, I was telling you physically the transitions and what was happening, and um, thank you for the support with Sarah Loomis with preschool. But now we are, we've posted and we'll be hiring a CSE secretary. Um, so moving right into trainings, Bob Real is our IEP direct uh, trainer from CineRec, and he will be here tomorrow all day. And initially it was to train Jen, Sarah, and myself. Now it's really to train me. Um, and I sent him an email today and said, how many chips do I have? Meaning how many days could you afford to spend in candor over the next three weeks to four weeks? And he said, as much time as you need, I'll be there for you. So that was, you know, I appreciate that. Uh, it's good to have those networks and those long lasting relationships over the last 15, 18 years. Mm -hmm. um, People step in and help you out. Uh, so, yeah. That's what's happening. <laughs> okay. Unless you have any, yeah. any, yeah. you have any <laughs> questions, I don't know. So you've been bored. <laughs> well, I was only able to paint the toenails on my left foot today. I'll um, work on the right ones tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, I wasn't supposed to say that. Thank you, Kim. And I've only worn my shirt backwards for a whole day. People are really like, I can't one time. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting there. Like you a friend. Friend. <laughs> yeah, our friend <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it wasn't that big. My son wears his sweatpants backwards all the time. He thinks the logo is supposed to be on like the back side. <laughs> <laughs> okay, dude. Nathan wore a bathing suit to school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I um, so I hope this is a last update on the website because it seems like it's moving along really well. Um, we're getting a lot of new content every week, which is great. Lots of new live feeds and new stories. And we've got a lot of people that have downloaded, students, I think, but maybe families as well, uh, parents have downloaded the app. So um, I think it's, it's going really well. Uh, I'm not sure from FG side, from the, the you know, the people that built it, if they, what our trajectory is, but I continue to see our numbers going up. Uh, we have about, uh, say, two or 300 people a day visiting the site, which I think is great. Um, obviously, when, when the weather's bad, that number goes up, yeah. because everybody's checking in on things. So, uh, but it's it's been going well, and I, I think it's uh, turned, out, turned out great. Um, and I think it's, it's a great way, now that it's easy to put things on a website, we put more things on the website and people get more information. So, um, so I, I think it's been going really well. Uh, I gave you the, the sort of the start of the technology plan. Uh, we have to submit this every three years. And this is a, a great time to actually be filming, completing this because of the rollout of the new computer science standards. And those standards are, if you happen to, to look online for those standards, they're um, K-12, um, grade level, uh, grade bands. So uh, K-2, uh, 3, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So it, it's broken down by bands, but each standard, um, it, there's there's something in there for, for each of those, uh, the, the standards there. And it's quite a bit. Uh, it's quite a lot of, of stuff. So we I've talked to our administrators, we've had conversations about uh, what should be in the plan, what our goals should be uh, for the plan, but primarily it's it's three parts. It's the standards, those standards becoming the base of our technology education, and then providing the support we need to do that. So the professional development 
to make sure that our teachers and anybody that is that is interacting with students in the, in the tech world are able to, to do that efficiently and, and know, have the skills to, to teach technology. And then the infrastructure, making sure that we're, we have the infrastructure and have all the things that we need to keep the, not only keep the network running, keep students connected, but not only here, but also when they leave here. So trying to support families that may not have access in whatever way we can, whether it's by giving them a hotspot or advocating for you know grants or working with state ed to try and promote you know funding for uh, more more broadband those sorts of things so we're trying to keep the technology plan sort of simple it doesn't mean that it's not there's not a lot to it but we're trying to keep it fairly fairly simple with focused on the standard um so we've Ben and I have been spending a lot of time looking at this. We've worked with TST, uh, representatives from TST who are coordinating efforts for all the districts uh, to sort of share ideas of, of what, what they're doing. And we are um, starting to talk to teachers a little bit. It's a little, it's a little bit challenging talking to teachers when we say we're going to focus on these new standards and then they worry that they are going to have to now teach, teach technology standards. So trying to give them that balance that we know that this is a three-year plan and we don't we know that we're not going to be asking you to do this next year. Um, it's developing a plan for how we're going to get to that point. And hopefully in three years, we're, we're really grounded in those standards. It's part of the curriculum and we have the skills from the PD, you know, from PD to, to do that, um, to teach those, teach those skills. Uh, so we're going to get feedback from uh, teachers, and then we I put it on the website uh, for families to, to look at it and provide feedback. Uh, in the feedback form, I asked if anybody wanted to be on a focus, focus group, and if we get people that are interested in uh, learning a little bit more about what the, the specific action steps are for the technology plan, we'll have either a virtual meeting or an in-person meeting in the middle of March sometime. Um, so, so if there's interest, we're happy to, to share that and get more feedback from, from families. Um, and we're going to continue to just uh, keep refining on these goals. I think these goals are pretty solid, uh, but just refining what the action steps are. And that'll be uh, presented to uh, both of you in April and then onto the state from there. And then Finally, the registration. Uh, when I was when we were building the website, and I saw how students were registering, um, the packet of papers that have been photocopied and scanned multiple times, and yet you have to download them and print them out and fill them out by hand, it made me a little bit crazy. So I just sort of made it a mission to digitize it. So that process is now all online, and I hope that it streamlines the process for families and for our staff. So uh, a family wants to register, they call, and we say we have an online registration piece. Part of it is in school tool. Um, they fill in their demographic information, and that automatically enrolls them, sort of not enrolls them, but gets them set up in school tool. And then we, um, either Leslie or Jackie, will send them an email with six documents that are all fillable, right? Um, online, they click on the link, they fill it all out, they digitally sign it, hit submit, and it comes right back to us. Um, so they don't have to download anything. They don't. It's just all really easy to, to fill out. So hopefully that'll just make it easy for people um, to do that. So so that's that we got going last week, and we the day that we were like, oh, you know, I wonder. If, when we're going to get the first one, I was talking to Katie and um, somebody, Jackie comes in and she's like, there's somebody that wants to register. And Katie goes, oh no. And I go, all right. And we did it. We did it. Perfect. I do keep sitting there, right? At the right time, it's like, perfect. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. So. Matt, question on the, was it CS for All that was through Cornell? Are we yeah. still involved in that? And does that tie in at all? To so CS for All kind of fell to the wayside a, a little bit. Um, and 
I think that the, the TST has picked up the computer science and digital fluency standards and is, is that sort of replacing okay. CS for all. Okay, got it. Yep. Makes sense. Yep. Thank you. And they're using some of those resources from CS for all with districts that, that want resources for computer science. So okay. the resources didn't get wasted. That's good. They'll just be re repackaged. Yep, kind of repackaged. Yep. <laughs> cool. And I noticed that when the BOCES people were here, um, Jeff and Dave, that two of our students are in PTAC. Uh -huh. Is that our avenue to try to get like a computer science curriculum or how how would a student who says, you know, I'd like to go into computer science, how would they go about that in middle school? So they want to start there. Yeah, so that's something that we currently in the tech program that John Benjamin uses, he has yeah. some computer science uh, yeah. modules there. So he can identify some students that might have an interest. We have some robotics here yep. that they can um, access. Uh, but we, we don't have a uh, computer science sort of scope and sequence here um, for them to take. So we really do direct them to, to BOCES currently because we just don't have the, the courses that oh, that's they fun. can learn. They have um, the system academy at the BOCES. So, yeah. so they have that. Um, p -Tech's really more for a targeted group of students that's rather right. than just that's open true. to any student. I know. So um, it's, it would be really just a specific student. Yeah. Specific okay, thanks. But that that is the sort of thing. Part of this tech plan is trying to think about where where are those where can we get those offerings like, and how can we? Is there a way for us to, to do more here um, to really not only identify those students but then foster and give them the skills sure. um, so that they are ready for some more advanced level computer science right. classes when they get into high school and they can take some online computer science classes that right. might be through other than other courses. Um, yeah. So that bridge between, you know, seventh and eighth grade and 11th and 12th grade when they can be on their own, that's sort of a something that we're working on. Yeah. Great. And so yeah. I, I can say, I think some of the things Matt and Ben are working on is having teachers embed some computer science literacy in the, in sure. the uh, work that they're already doing in the classroom. Yep. So that's, yeah. that's really, I mean, and, and eventually, could we have our own standalone courses? Yeah, they don't, they are just, schools are just, and I say schools, colleges are just uh, talking about and starting computer science uh, certifications. They don't even have one right. at this point. For so, teachers. For teachers, right. right. So they for have teachers, right. certified computer science uh, <laughs> teacher. They're not out there right now. You, they have a kind of, if you have taught a computer science class somewhere along the way, you could be. I guess you can grandfather it into that for a period of time. Is that not correct? Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I did it in 1978, 1981. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. It's something that's really, I think, a lot of districts, it's just starting for a yeah. lot of them. Sure. And, and I think of both following through both is fine. You know, I mean, yeah. if, when you look at who do you have to teach that stuff? You know, teach the courses. Sure. Yeah. Or even having a BOCES course here that you could say, well, Wednesdays is going to be a candor, and then Spencer's going to pay for it, and then Thursday will be the candor, and Tioga pays for it. I'm <laughs> sure we can work something else. You know. I like your thinking. Okay. Thank you, guys. Of course. And if you have feedback, like you review this, have feedback the form, there is a form online, or you can just email me if you guys have feedback, or if anybody in the public, even if you know, feel free to reach out. Happy to have a conversation about technology. Holly, well, wow. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so the first bullet I put out about warranty parts, so that is new to us. Um, it used to be that Rob could call. When there's a part that um, we needed to replace, but it was still on warranty, you could just call up and order it, and they would ship it to us, and he would replace it, and that would be good. But now we've changed it where he has to call up to the nearest bus, which is up in Syracuse. He has to make an appointment. They have to come down and scope it out themselves and diagnose it. Um, set up an appointment to, well, verify the warranty, and then they call and order it, and we'll get it eventually, and 
so that can put a bus out for quite a while. So that's we're looking forward to that. <laughs> Are they having like people hoarding warranty parts or what? what? I think it's just hard to get parts right now. I, I so they're trying that's... to delay by themselves. Mm -hmm. Either that or make diagnosis, right? Right. Well, that's right. 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 money out Correct. of pocket. Yep. There's a warranty card that you didn't need. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we get people calling for extended warranties all the time. <laughs> <laughs> we sign up for one of those. So true. <laughs> I got a couple of buses. <laughs> <laughs> Try it next time they call. <laughs> um, again, the cost of everything is just increasing, so we've already talked about that. One huge issue we're having right now is people running their rides every single day. We have two or three buses that come back and talk about the cars that ran the rides. It's scary as anything. So luckily, we on the two new buses that we got this year, we have the stop arm cameras. Yeah. So we're looking at getting them to all done and just doing it now because we were um, being right there with the troopers. They um, were able to view a tape and went and visited a young man and gave him a ticket the other night. Good. So um, that's our goal. It's just, just I, I don't know what else to do. He said, do you want me to ticket him? And I said, absolutely, because if we don't do something, it's right. it, someone's going to get hurt. So it's going to die. we own those images, why like, like, can't we just publicly shame them? <laughs> 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 can you put a picture of the ticket next to him? Uh, uh, no, no, no. You can just put, you can, hey, here, here's the red light runner. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's really it's scary. On the so, website. Yeah. Um, website. Come on. I, I just built this nice. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't do that. Idea. <laughs> <laughs> the tickets are pretty substantial, though, aren't they? Yeah. Like the, it ranges. I, I, I think it's like two fifty for the first one. Yeah, and then it only goes up to fifty bucks. Yeah, really yeah, no, more. I thought it was like yeah. five hundred to start or something. No, it's not but if we um if we can start ticketing some people, I think it would yeah. send a message. I don't know. I don't know if it will. It just blows my mind that they even do it. I don't. It doesn't make sense to me, but um, it's happening every day. So. Where do they actually do? Is it like stopping as a kid stops on the highway, or? Um, I would say the majority are from Wilseyville to Oregon Heights, and people. Yeah. I don't. They just all on ninety six though. A lot of it. We also get Oregon Road. Yeah. Wow. Uh, we've had them on Prospect Valley. Prospect oh my Valley. Gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I was saying so, ninety six uh, or ninety six and yeah, ninety six. Yep. And I, it's scary. I don't. I, I don't know if they're. I don't know what it is, but it's. It's frightening. It's very frightening. Are you going to be able to get cameras? So that's what we're looking into. Um, I mean, like availability wise. Even. Uh, hopefully, we've been in touch with the company, and they're and they're ready to come out and help us. So I think we can get them. Um, and I think it would be wise to do it. Are you put a notice on the website that from the transportation department saying that this is. We just did it. Katie, oh, you did? Sorry. Katie just did it. Um, the other day. Wednesday. Last couple days ago, we put one up. Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, like, great. English. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Katie and I just finished all the training that I've been telling you about for the last couple months that we Fine. Well, we aren't done yet. We go next Wednesday for the 100 question test and interview, and then we go back up um, for the driving test, and we'll do we'll actually be grading each other, and that's how you uh, that's how we get through it, I guess. So that's coming up, um, and then we submitted our video for the SBBI, so that we're waiting for feedback on as well. And then the last thing I talked about was Traversa. So um, yeah. this is not something that I'm set on. We've been talking about what we can do, different options. We had Traversa before COVID. Um, I was honestly a little overwhelmed by it with COVID. Um, there are 80 different routes in there and then add COVID in when we had half days and we were running. And those, they changed so often, like it just didn't work. So I went back to paper and pencil, basically, and did it myself. Um, but I think we're ready to move to something else. And it's also the biggest thing. So probably the first time that I subbed um, driving for a route, and it was dark, it was foggy, and it was raining, and I 
it, been, it was up on Gary Morris's run, and it was, um, well, where doesn't he go? He has so many runs or runs up there. <laughs> he has left right now, but um, I, the first stop was on Cander Hill. The student wasn't there, so you go on to the next one, you're hoping, okay, am I too early? Am I too late? Am I, like, why is this kid not out here? You go to the next one. I pick up that student, and he said, I said, hey, buddy, I said, you want to sit up here with me and just kind of help me? Do you know the route? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Little fourth grader, so so excited to help me get going down the road. And he said, "Well, I think you stop here, but no, maybe they're remote now. <laughs> no, well, maybe that's in the afternoon. You drop them off, and I'm like, oh my gosh. And he goes, you know what? I actually sleep during the route. He said, I'm just gonna go to sleep. I was like, oh, all right. So you're trying to read the sheet that I've so nicely put together. <laughs> it just doesn't work. So with this Traversa, um, they have tablets that you can get that will talk to you and it will tell you where your next stop is and if i get i get multiple phone calls in the morning saying this student's on this student's not on whatever i can take them out of route for that day so not that the drivers would need it every single day because they know the route but i can tell you when there's a sub on that bus it's a beautiful thing yeah. <laughs> so that's something we're looking into but there i get emails all the time about different ones so it might not be traversal that we look at but we're looking at different ones that makes sense. And with, I mean, I put in there all the different things that you can do with Traversa. Um, with attendance, the attendance really came up with COVID. They needed to know what seat they're in, who was around them, because then you had to do contact tracing. So for the drivers, as they're trying to figure out the route and then mark down, oh, this student's here. Oh, but Johnny, <laughs> the brother didn't get on. That's a nightmare. So they would have a card that they just swipe when they get out of the bus and it puts them out as a tenant. So um, there's that, there's the driver book that they have to fill out for the pre-trip and post-trip every day. Um, that would be on there as well. So there's a, there's a lot of things that it could offer, but um, it's pricey. So we are looking at other things as well. So, could the kids go in front of the camera? School full? And they link with school full. Yep. Oh. Yep. That one does. Traverse does. That. I don't know if other ones do. Right. So. That's that. Thank you. And then Mike Williams report, and then Brent. Okay, so um, I'm going to start with something I didn't put in the written report. It's summer school, and as I go through my report, I'm sure you're going to pick up a theme here, but it's, I, I, I can't avoid it. So um, with this this year's summer school coming together, there's no one from Pat all the way down to Matt that didn't really contribute a lot to us building what I believe is going to be the best summer school program for kids that we could possibly offer. Um, and, you know, I mentioned everybody on the administrative team, um, when Kim was talking about it, she talked about all the teachers in both buildings, looking at what are our prerequisite skills, what do we want our students to come in with, and then starting already to think about building um, a, a summer curriculum. It's a lot of work. And again, everybody here had a, had a major part. Uh, so I'm, I'm just happy to be here and part of it. Our next step now, we're ready to advertise it. We have to get a sense of how many uh, takers we'll have, how many students we'll have, how many will need transportation. So we'll, we'll put out uh, on our website and maybe through some other um, media um, questionnaires just to gauge interest so we can take it to the next step. You know, I said everybody, the, the funding for it is learning cost, uh, learning loss recovery that has to be spent in the summer, but it, it really has come together. Um, something, again, from Kent to Matt, I probably contributed the least to, but I'm the most proud of it. It really is fantastic. Um, we will, and that's right, um, invite Spencer Vanette and students to come because of their capital project. They're not going to be able to run their standard summer school program. Um, so, again, in the morning area, we will get uh, compensated for it, so it will work for everybody. Um, and as we mentioned before, the students, when we get them together, are great. I mean, they're both in small communities, small uh, districts, so it just gives them more opportunities. Um, the first thing I did put in my written report is I wanted to thank everybody for getting me off my first budget um, this season. Um, and again, I'm back to that. I couldn't have given the little presentation I gave to the Budget Advisory Committee. I wouldn't be as well versed so I can take good advice if it wasn't for everybody here. 
and again, including mm-hmm. you know the, the ranks of the teachers who, uh, as um, mm-hmm. Wayne mentioned, I've been talking to, listening to, and, and were able to help us. Uh, they were able to help me understand the budgetary priorities for students. So that's been great. Um, we've had a lot of shifts, and there may be a few more. Everybody from Jack to Matt has been amazing, amazing, you know, just really impressing how willing they are to step up. And if someone like uh, Kim Nichols takes on two jobs simultaneously, just that's only able to work because everybody's supporting her in doing that. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about, and I hope I'm not going to be talking about this much longer, our, our plan for COVID. As you've met, everybody from Jack to Matt has come together to make sure we have a plan. Um, we may come back from break and have no mass mandate. That doesn't mean it would be over for us, but I know we have families who feel very strongly on every, you know, each end of the spectrum. And there are going to be people who maybe for good reason have someone ill at home who are still scared. So we'll have a plan to accommodate people who choose to still wear masks, make sure students aren't feeling uncomfortable, making sure that we make those adjustments to seating arrangements, so that we can stay focused on our primary purpose, provide the best possible instruction and not let this distract us. So again, another transition's on the way. I think it's one that most people are very happy and ready for. Um, but that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. There's still going to be steps. And, and again, great place to be to go through this. So thank you. That's good. <laughs> Follow-up questions on summer school is that that's K or one twelve or something? No, it's it's K twelve because we have kids coming out of preschool and we'd love to have come and get some summer experience. Oh, and where I said, you know, we're not just yet. Yes, the, the academic piece in, um, is important. Um, it's, I would also call it academic, but what we're referring to is the enrichment piece. Yeah. It's just going to be good, fun learning experiences with other students here at school over the summer. Um, the phys ed department, the arts department, everybody's contributing to it. So, uh, and it will be something for everybody. K fall. So, where necessary, will some of the, like if you're inviting Spencer to come in, will some of their staff or teachers be available to? Them? Yes. So, first we have to gauge uh, interest, sure. get a rough idea how many students we should be expecting. Then we'll build the classes to the one sector in each grade level. That's what I'm expecting minimum. Um, but maybe some grade levels will have more than one. Really. Then we fill those positions with teachers who are willing, ready, and able to do it. Um, we're, you know, it's, it's all about the learning. So if we have great teachers who don't want to commit to the entire uh, summer program, but want to split it. I'm a third grade teacher, and Mrs. Inkle's a third grade teacher. I'll do the first few weeks, you do the second few weeks. We can do that. Um, that will only work because of the work everyone's doing so that there's a set curriculum. Here's what you're teaching on which day. We have the talented people. So we have retired. Really, I'm hoping there's enough teachers between uh, Candor and Spencer Van Ann. But if not, we'll go outside. We'll be able to break all those positions. So, Katie, this is less like last year where it was like two weeks, where like one kids for one week and kids for yeah. one week. This is a full on mm-hmm. six weeks, um, July 11th to yeah, August 18th or 16th, but right. six weeks. I mean, uh, some families in yeah, Monday through Thursday times, I, mean, I keep saying tentatively, but 9 30 to 1 30. And possibly Pete's talking with the Youth Commission, maybe doing some kind of partnership um, or Brent. I can't remember which one. Maybe both have talked to them. Um, but obviously, we know not. You know, a family might not be able to commit all six weeks for their kids, so right. that'll be flexible too. And breakfast and lunch, okay, transportation by each district. Yeah. And then the pairing with. The youth, youth association would be for like 130 till. That's what's working. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. That is very good. Right? Okay. And then again, the funding is grant. So we'll do that. Yeah, we're really hoping for a good Yeah, we yeah that's I think, think you will. I mean, so. Nail it down and then advertise that. Right? Yeah, sure. Um, 
Yeah, people know that would be a very good program. Transportation is good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. I don't know what's under your hands. Thanks. Board comments. Well, I want to thank everybody. I mean, honest to God, you do from Matt to Kat, especially, <laughs> especially Kat. We, we never appreciate her enough. <laughs> Please put that in the. You can it. Yeah. Yeah, you always have to put your writing there. You can put it on the But it is really very happy to see all the work that's going on. And you're all focused towards the education of the children. That's what we're all about. I think it. You guys are doing a great job. And with COVID around, I don't think we can appreciate you enough. We, well, here, I'll give you some imaginary money. <laughs> Thank you all. I'm only the I'm the only one who's gonna say thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, it's all thank you. Everything that everyone has said is positive and overwhelming. It's exciting. Enjoy your week off yeah. or yeah. your week of <laughs> quiet <laughs> with the quiet ish. I'm trying to keep qualifying. <laughs> well earned, quiet ish week. <laughs> um, recognition of visitors. Right. Uh, or Katie, would you like to say anything? Did you hear anything about the students in the career and tech participating in Skills USA competition? No. And this area should be very proud of the number of students that participated. We had a number of first place as well as second and third place in different categories. Of course, I left that all home, so I can't tell you. <laughs> but this is the first, um, well, this is the third year that BOCES has been back into that U.S., the Skills USA program. When I was on the board before it was a big thing where a lot of our students ended up going to national competition. So hopefully, now that we're back into that, you know, we will be able to send some kids on to regionals and state and national competitions. And we did have it's posted on our website. Ty Evans took third in uh, uh, auto, service. Auto, auto service. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I did see that. That's, yeah. yeah. So, Wow. I'm very happy that we're back doing that. Well, thank you. That's wonderful. Katie, any comments? No, I'm very thankful to be part of the district. Thankful my daughter's part of the district. Thank you. I think we're more thankful than you are part of the district. <laughs> you. you are. <laughs> really. All right. We are adjourned at 847. Thanks, everybody. Sure, sure. Thank you.